Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're going to look at Exodus 38, but we're also going to look at an article from Dave Ramsey on the average American debt. It may sound like those two things have nothing to do with one another, but Exodus 38 describes inventory time. And I think that a, an application of that for you and I personally as New Testament Christians today might be a similar kind of inventory. Uh, all of this in Exodus points to Jesus. Okay, I'm not going to say that Exodus 38 is a precursor to Dave Ramsey. <laughs> no, it's a precursor to Jesus. What we're talking about in Exodus is the foundation for the atonement itself. But at this step, I do think that secondarily, it may be time for a similar inventory of our own lives. These stats are pretty staggering. Um, this is from RamseySolutions.com. I'm accessing this on June 14th, uh, 2024. And here's the, the quick takeaways. The average American debt per U.S. adult is $66,772. Each student loan borrower owes an average of 38000 The typical uh, household in the U.S. has nearly $36,000 in car debt. That's crazy to me, too, because I like cool cars, and I drive a pretty cool car. I didn't pay nearly $36,000 for it. That's got to be from people driving. Um, that's got to be from people with multiple car loans at a time. All right? Oh, man, that's... This is staggering to me. This is craziness. All right, my family has been in uh, medical debt before. We then transferred that to a no interest credit card and worked on it. But uh, we also paid off our student loans pretty fast. I'll be honest, that was pretty easy for me with scholarships. I didn't have that much student loan debt, just a tiny, a tiny loan. Uh, credit card debt per household, 19865 I, I want to say that's coming down. I want to say that was higher at one point, but I think what he's measuring is the difference between is it Q1 and Q4 of 2023. Wow, we've got 17.5 trillion debt total. That is crazy. 1.6 trillion of that is student loan debt. It's student loan debt. Man. All right, I, I know that I'm going to sound like entitled on both ends of the spectrum because for one thing like I didn't really have that much student loan debt to, to pay off myself and then also now I'm an adjunct professor <laughs> so like I'm I'm full disclosure I'm I, I profit in a tiny way from this industry myself but I, I I gotta say like remember you signed up for that loan okay you knew that it would be due you you promised to pay it back so that can't catch you off guard you got to make sure that the average income of someone with your degree can handle a debt load like that. I mean, I, I'll bet that like a, a doctor, a surgeon, um, you know, or even someone like a dermatologist. I, I once I once heard like dermatologists do really well as doctors because, you know, they they work a nine to five and they don't have they they have a regular office hour. They have regular predictable schedules. But somebody like that could handle spending six figures on a degree. Start by looking at the average starting salary for somebody with your degree and look at the employment rate in that field uh, before you start a degree program. Okay, this might be too late to give this advice to people who are already in college, but if you're, if you're in high school or if you've got a high schooler in your house, please consider that. Please look at the average income of somebody in that field um, and, and look at the average employment rate in that field for that school. Okay, if you find a school, uh, say like the College of Engineering at the University of such and such, and they have a 100% employment rate in their field post-graduation, that's a really good sign. Then look at the average starting salary uh, for people in that given field. I want to say that currently software engineers are the highest paid engineers. Uh, what was their average starting salary last year? It was like 149K. Uh, that's that's pretty good. That's about what it takes to make it in this economy and buy a house in this market around here, if not, frankly, more. Um, but I understand medical debt very personally. Um, credit card debt, I hope it's not stupid credit card debt. I hope it's not because you're just out there shopping for stuff. Uh, I'm not anti-auto loans, by the way, uh, because, you know, the interest on an auto loan, you'll end up paying... 
Let's see. We took out, we did, we financed my wife's Honda Pilot. And I want to say that we only, we paid a whopping like $600 in interest total over the life of that loan. And, uh, you know, you could have paid cash for it up front, but the cash could have been invested and yielded a return that far outweighed, uh, you know, the measly $600 paid in interest over the life of a loan of, what was it, like three to five years, something like that. And we always pay them off early too. So I'm not anti-auto loan because the interest rates are just crazy low. And if you've got that much cash on hand, buy a bunch of shares of Spider with it and make back more money. Uh, you know, if you've got that kind of cash sitting around, don't put it into a depreciating asset because you're gonna buy the car, the car's gonna be worth significantly less. All right, I'm not anti-auto loan. You can buy a, take out a take out a loan, put a decent amount down, you pay a few hundred in interest over the course of years, and then you still have that cash and you can invest it. All right, you could buy buy shares of Spider, S P Y, uh, you know, the ETF that just kind of is the overall index for the S P 500. I'm not going to give stock advice. I'm not qualified to do that. I'm just speculating that, you know, you if you've got enough cash to pay cash for a car, uh, great. You know, why don't you make that money work for you and earn money for you rather than uh, putting it all into something that immediately, immediately goes down in value? Uh, here's the breakdown of credit card debt by age. The majority of the people holding this debt are in their 40s. It goes down a bit in the 50s. But the 30-somethings, we 30-somethings are worse off than the 60-year-olds. We're in a third place and we're about to jump into first in the next decade of our lives. Uh, student loan debt predictably is, uh, you know, goes down as you get older, but good grief, there are still people in their 70s with student loan debt? Man, that is crazy to me. Uh, and then, wow, you're not done paying it off in your 30s either? These people must have taken out loans to the tune of 200K for basket weaving degrees or something like that, <laughs> said the guy who got a bachelor's degree in percussion performance. <laughs> I mean, even with that degree, I turned that into a business that would, in its best year, netted 40K a year for me. And that was drumming for crying out loud. That was hitting things with sticks. So I know there's a way to monetize even seemingly obscure degrees. HELOC debt, this is interesting uh, because my wife and I have considered this, but we don't wanna go into we don't want to leverage a HELOC into other investments. This is when you take out a loan based on what your house is worth. So you, you're, that's, that's pretty high stakes collateral there. You be careful doing that. Um, if you put that HELOC into something like an Arby's in Idaho, uh, that's pretty cool. But remember, you still got to pay interest on your own HELOC debt. Uh, to me, if you're gonna if you're gonna play with this kind of fire, uh, make, I, I would start off with like. I would start off with like flips. Use that money to flip houses. That way you get an instant cash back return. You can pay the HELOC off and then save the Delta up. And then that's what you invest into something ongoing. Does that make sense? Use the HELOC, borrow against your house, but do it for something like a flip so that you're not locked into perpetual payments on the HELOC. And then make sure that whatever you flip, you know, if it's a house or a business or whatever, make sure that you know, you don't immediately just spend that delta. That's what you're, that, that delta, that remainder after you've paid off the HELOC is your true profit. Save that up. And then that is, that little savings account would become, uh, you know, the means by which you could eventually uh, invest safely in something like um, townhomes, condos, um, duplexes across the US without saddling yourself with a high interest HELOC. Evidently, very 1%. Only 1% of this debt is held by millennials? Millennials, come on. I mean, like, HELOC debt is not a good thing to have per se. It's high risk, but only 1% of it is millennials? Um, and then mortgage debt. This is understandable. This is going to be your biggest, this is going to be your biggest debt. Um, ages 18 to 29, average non-mortgage debt per person is 13000 Average non non mortgage debt for thirty to thirty nine is twenty six, um, and then it goes to, at the highest is in the forties to forty nine. Average non mortgage debt per person is twenty eight thousand dollars. 
you can see that mortgage debt is not that big a deal among 18 to 29 year olds. Um, that's because there are not a lot of them that can buy houses in this market. And then it increases significantly into the 40s and kind of stays stagnant into the 70s. And then you can see HELOC debt. There it is. The orange debt starts to become more popular. If you're in your 60s and your 70s, you got a, HELOC, a lot of HELOC debt. Be careful with that HELOC debt. I think that HELOCs are best spent on uh, quick flip investments, not long-term buy and holds. Um, you're better off using your HELOC for something quick and then accumulating the, the delta and investing that. Um, car prices have gone up 30, 32%. That is insane. Uh, in March of 2024, the median home price in America was 420, 429. That would be, that would be nice if that were the average around Seattle. That's an increase of over 130,000 since the start of 2020. So just imagine if he wrote this article just for the Seattle area, uh, you know, his, his either Dave Ramsey or his, whatever staff member wrote this, their jaw would be on the floor. Credit card interest rates. This is a killer right here. Uh, the average interest rate for credit cards has gone from 16.61% at the start of 2020 to 22.63% in 2024. That's what kills you, man. If you've got credit card debt, you know, and that's in the tens of thousands and you're paying and those interest rates kick in on you, um, you could be paying 1,200 to 2,000 a month and barely making any difference on it. Uh, and then, of course, gas prices. Take whatever he writes about gas prices and like triple it, and you're close to halfway to what we'd face here in Washington because our state adds another tax on top of this already exorbitant cost. Oh, and by the way, electricity has gone up like 30%. Uh, grocery prices have increased by a whopping 25%. I'll bet that's over 30% for Washington state. And then insurance premiums. Um, man, that's, that stuff stinks because you don't even notice a difference there. Like when your premiums go up and your taxes go up and the, the, the cost of just like living your life, not changing anything, all of it just goes up. There's nothing you could do about that. I, I genuinely believe that inflation is worse than a recession because a session, recessions eventually abate and things get better. And during a recession, even if you lose your job, there are always still jobs available. But now in a, an inflation, you've got a job and it's just never enough. Uh, during a recession, you can depend upon friends and family uh, who are well established. Maybe have they, maybe your mom and dad have a paid off mortgage and you can go live with them or something like that. But during inflation, like everybody's struggling. Everybody's hurting. They're, they're the, only, they're, they're the only relief uh, for the only relief for inflation, uh, is for ultimately the the Fed to bring interest rates down. But they've kind of had to hike interest rates because we started printing money like a stupid banana republic after COVID. So the total debt uh, uh, changed from Q, uh, Q1 of 2020 to Q, Q4 of 2023. Excuse me. Okay. It wasn't just over the course of 2023. It was the course of 2020 to Q4 of 2023. Total debt, $3.2 trillion. This is craziness. And then if you've never read this stuff before, take a look at Dave Ramsey's uh, snowball method. Okay. If you're, uh, if you're deep in debt, it's time to do a quick inventory. Uh, look at your debt and then stack all the debts up. And, 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 uh, oh, sorry, what he really says, step one is to start your emergency fund of $1,000. And then you put all, list all of your debts from smallest to largest Okay. Uh, in the interest of taking inventory, let's take inventory here personally. This is a, I'm telling you, this is the, this is one of the greatest things you're going to do for your own financial future and your well being, your ability, especially, especially men. I'm looking at you to be able to provide for your family. If you've got debt, list them in order. Now there, I'm going to, I'm going to humbly deviate ever so slightly from Dave Ramsey on this. Um, I was debt free before everything happened with Aiden. Um, and then managed to pay that debt off again. Uh, but the way that I did it, the, uh, in my second get out of debt, you know, campaign was slightly different from this. Um, you don't have to necessarily l go from smallest to largest. You could also, what, what I did was I arranged them by interest rate. I paid down the one with the highest interest rate first because interest is just such a killer. And I knew that I'd be putting more toward principal ultimately. Uh, this is called the snowball method because psychologically it's good. If you've got, if, if you only owe, you know, 1200 bucks on your car or something like that, that's your first debt that you pay off. 
you don't pay much interest on the car loan, but psychologically it's good for you because now that three or $400 a month you were paying to the car is now going to the next biggest debt, which is student loan or credit card or whatever it may be. He has you line them up from smallest to largest. What I did personally was just uh, uh, line them up in terms of interest rate and pay down the highest interest rate one first. Uh, and that's called, I think some, some financial advisors might call that the cascade method. Um, but if you've never done this before and you, 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 you doubt that you'll have like the, what he calls gazelle intensity to stick with it and follow it through, you might just consider the snowball method. And what you do once you've made this list of your debts from smallest to largest, or like what, what I did from highest interest rate to lowest interest rate, uh, you make minimum payments, on all the, all the other debts, except for the one that you're focusing on. Okay. He recommends the smallest one first. I personally did the highest interest one first, and then you just move on to the next debt. Okay. You don't, you don't say like, Oh great. I don't longer have that $400 a month car payment. That means I can spend $400 on beanie babies this month. No, instead that all goes toward the next debt. And so that's why he calls it your snowball because it gets bigger as you go. Uh, and then there's a whole lot more to it. Dave Ramsey's written a lot of great articles on this. But I go through that financial spiel on debt and taking inventory as an application secondarily to today's text. Here is Exodus 38, beginning in verse 21. This is the inventory for the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony that was recorded at Moses' command. It was the work of the Levites under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made everything that the Lord commanded Moses. With him was Oholiab, son of Ahishamach, of the tribe of Dan, a gem cutter, a designer, and an embroiderer with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen. All the gold of the presentation offering that was used for the project and all the work on the sanctuary was 2,193 pounds, according to the sanctuary shekel. Wow, it's over a ton. The silver from those, uh, those of the community who were registered was 7,554 pounds, according to the sanctuary shekel. One-fifth of an ounce per man, that is half a shekel, according to the sanctuary shekel, from everyone 20 years old or more who had crossed over to the registered group, 603,550 men. So this is why we get the figure of, you know, I... Uh, 1.2 to 1.3 million. By the time the Exodus reaches the Jordan River, it's probably going to be a nation of over 3 million. Uh, but because we've got 600 plus thousand men here, we're estimating uh, there's another 600,000 women. And so that's 1.2 million. And then who knows how many kids we have here. Uh, that everyone who is 20 years old or more is specified here does lend some clarity to the fact that the older generation of the Exodus group would not make it into the promised land. It's possible that everyone who was 20 years old or younger at the time of this survey, this census, this inventory, these are the ones who would follow Joshua and Caleb into the promised land. And it also, as a bit of a side note, uh, further complicates discussions of the age of accountability doctrine. Sometimes that's conflated with the bar mitzvah or the bat mitzvah, which could be 12 or 13 years old, but that's a Jewish tradition not prescribed by the Old Testament. The Old Testament describes an inventory and a census taken of everyone who is 20 years old and older. So that's not central to today's text. <laughs> Jesse, neither was Dave Ramsey. Bear with me. Verse 27, there were 7,500 pounds of silver used to cast the bases of the sanctuary and the bases of the curtain, 100 bases from 7,500 pounds, 75 pounds for each base. With the remaining 44 pounds, he made the hooks for the posts, overlaid their tops, and supplied bands for them. The bronze of the presentation offering totaled 5,310 pounds. He made it with the bases for the entrance to the tent of meeting, the bronze altar and its bronze grate, all the utensils for the altar, the bases for the surrounding courtyard, the bases for the gate of the courtyard, all the tent pegs for the tabernacle, and all the tent pegs for the surrounding courtyard. That is a lot of bronze. That's a lot of silver. That's a lot of gold. They have taken a full inventory of everything, and they've even measured it in terms of its exchange rate 
uh, according to the to the shackle. And so they've got a full inventory of how much everything was worth, how much everything actually cost. I can relate to this as a church planter where at my time of recording, uh, man, this is funny. By the time you guys are watching this, we very well could have a building. That's pretty exciting. Uh, right now, we've just made an offer on a beautiful building. We've got some competition. Uh, you may know more than I do at this point because I'm recording this on June 14th. And any date after that, you guys know something that I don't. Uh, so, man, how cool is this little time capsule? We've taken an inventory, and we know uh, what we can afford and what we could afford, you know, given uh, the plans that we've made with the daycare and laid those at the feet of the Lord. Uh, we, know, uh, we know what our monthly budget is. We know what our expenses are. We've taken an inventory, and uh, we're not going to necessarily play it safe. We have faith that God provides and so there is a direct correlation between faith and risk. Um, and that's governed by strong discernment because we can do math. We can do arithmetic. Uh, you know, I'm not one to buy something that I cannot afford. Uh, and that being said, as a church planter in the most expensive real estate market in the U.S., we've got to take risks. We've got to take risks. We've got to take risks. And it's worth that risk uh, because it's for the kingdom of God. So I'm willing to, to try something, you know, but I've got to take inventory first. You take inventory of your own personal finances. If you are up to your eyeballs in debt, would you take an inventory and would you consider, uh, would you consider the Dave Ramsey approach? The book that he wrote on this, I think is Total Money Makeover. I'm sure it's on Amazon. It's worth every penny a thousand times over. Uh, hey, <laughs> If we have a building by now, if you guys know this, uh, uh, let's see, the date you guys are watching this is, is the, is it the 20th? Okay. Wow. It's possible then that we could just be, um, you know, like a couple weeks away from having a building. We'll have a Dave Ramsey course at our church one day <laughs> because it's really helpful. Uh, like he says over and over again, the, the borrower is slave to the lender. And so would you get your freedom back, take an inventory, look with eyes wide open at your debt and put a plan in place. I know that's painful, but take an inventory. Evidently, America is just up to our eyeballs in debt, and um, we've frankly been a bunch of morons financially. Um, our, our, uh, <laughs> pray for the governor of Washington and his successor. Pray for the president of the United States. Pray for everybody who's in authority. Uh, pray that they discovered the calculator and this thing called a balanced budget. Please, God, let our leaders discover arithmetic. Please, God. Uh, because not even Trump, by the way, did anything to address the deficit. We're up past our eyeballs in debt as a nation. So please, God, give us someone who's willing to lead sensibly. Take an inventory. What do we have? What do we owe? What's a plan to actually get out of this debt? So apply this personally in light of the inventory of Exodus. But as we close, don't forget what Exodus actually is. As I said at the beginning, its ultimate application is not Dave Ramsey. It's not getting out of debt even. This was a full look at everything that God had provided. If you recall from our, our curriculum a couple of weeks ago, they had more than enough. They had more than enough. They even called for a cessation of the free will offerings because they just had more than enough. They were overflowing with provision to the point that they had to say, just stop bringing so much gold because we've got more than enough here. This was an outpouring of generosity from the people. This was made possible by the generous gifts of the people. And they gave freely because there was no more important structure in the world than this tabernacle, the means by which God would speak through Moses to his chosen people in the Old Testament. This miniature foreshadowing of the throne room of heaven right there on the earth, moving around the Exodus sands. This mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant as the direct presence of God on the earth and the precursor to the full sacrifice made by Jesus Christ on the cross. They gave so generously and they spent so much because there was nothing more valuable in the world than this. 
They stepped out in faith and gave freely. They gave generously, and the Lord blessed their efforts. The Lord prescribed every step for the tabernacle. The tabernacle is built, and now as we as we come we come to a close in the next uh, two days in our series of Exodus, you can see that the Holy Spirit of God is at work through His people. Ask any of those people if they regretted giving those gifts. This was critical. This was worth every penny. This was worth all the silver, all the gold, all the bronze from everything from the, basically the grill, <laughs> the, the, the meat offering altar to the incense burner, to the golden lampstand, to the mercy seat, to the bronze tent pegs that held everything together. It was worth all of it because this was how people could be reconciled to God. There's nothing, nothing, nothing more important in the world than that.